Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Brad and Brian Baker are here from Cal Fire to talk about aerial firefighting. It's an area that uh, I'm just uh, thrilled to learn more about as a pilot. So, so cool. Before we get started, as usual, just a few quick notes. Tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available through our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search on one word, social flight. That's social flight, one word on YouTube. That'll take care of it for you. In addition to that, be sure, as always, to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. There are tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. And in addition to that, we have lots of prizes. If you get the mobile app, it allows you to check in at airports. And just doing that even once during a given prize period has you entered in to win our drawing. And with that, I'd like to just, uh, we have one uh, initial photo here. Uh, our, our winner of uh, the Lightspeed Zulu 3 is Brian Mettler. This is his aircraft. We'll have more information from him to share uh, shortly. And so this just shows you some information about that. And uh, also, of course, would like to uh, thank um, uh, Whip Air and the Fire Boss. We're here to talk about aerial firefighting tonight. And uh, they're one of the supporters of Social Flight. They help make this app free for all of you. And this is an amazing aircraft that I got to see uh, when I was both at their factory and then also down at Sun and Fun. Uh, so very, very cool stuff to see there. And so um, with that, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit for Brad and Brian Baker, tanker flying and aerial firefighting are in their blood, including their father as well. They literally grew up around the aircraft and the people who support the mission of containing wildfires. From single engine trainers all the way to the powerful C-130 aircraft, they have flown them all. And they're here tonight to give us a glimpse into this amazing corner of aviation. So I am going to bring them online right now. Let's uh, welcome Brad and Brian Baker. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? Hey, Brad. Fantastic, how are you this evening? Hey, first of all, I just want to thank you both for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule and also to let everyone know that we may actually uh, have uh, uh, anyone, I believe Bra uh, Brian may leave at any moment if he gets called to a fire. And so uh, you guys are actively uh, engaged in this and the wildfires, uh, the season is already happening. Is that the case? It is. It is. It's a it's, uh, little bit of an early season, but uh, seems to be... Uh, Pretty pretty normal here over the last couple of years that we're uh, pretty much pretty much underway throughout the entire state of California. So uh, guys, I'd like to start with with some background because I did you know I really glossed over it to say the least uh, about how you grew up in an aviation family. Uh, your your dad Doug Baker still flying S twos and uh, you sent me a picture I'm going to share here um, of the two of you. <laughs> On on top of this is on top of an S2. Yeah, that's on top of the A model. Probably uh, 1987, maybe I'm thinking, maybe 86. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me what it's like to uh, how you grew up, how you got uh, it first just into aviation and got your wings, and then uh, get into the family business here. Uh, that that picture pretty much tells the story. I mean, it was you know. We were, my dad likes to joke we were bottle fed at a tanker base, so which is in an airport. So we spent a lot of time around airplanes, and one thing just leads to another. You know, you have you have uh, certain directions you can go in life, but you know the, the most influential are the ones from the beginning, right? So we spent a lot of time at an airport as young kids, and it just progressed from there. And especially aerial firefighting, camaraderie, and the, the the sense of mission, and all the the radial engine airplanes helped, and uh, that that was that was the biggest factor. Were you able to go along early on uh, uh, when you were really little and, and kind of uh, ride jump seat and see what this was all about? Uh, no, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not. But those are restricted category airplanes. <laughs> no, you don't want to admit it. <laughs> never admit. But those are restricted category airplanes, so it's it's crew members only. Got it. Okay. We'll, we'll gloss over that one. How about from the yeah. ground then? <laughs> so what, what was most of your experience like in terms of uh, – uh, spending time around the big aircraft versus how did you get started? Uh, most people, of course, start from smaller planes and, and work up. 
Well, I think Brad, the first airplane engine Brad and I both got to start was a 1820 on a on a S2. So that was kind of that kind of puts the hooks in you from there. But like that picture showed, we you know from as young as I can remember, we were loading tankers, fueling fueling tankers, you know, reloading them with retardant, um, checking the oil, uh, and just it, basically a, a from the, from Jump Street uh, blue collar aviation. You know, getting your hands dirty, pulling cowlings, helping mechanics change parts and change tires and change cylinders and all that stuff. It was just that's that's what aviation was to to Brad and I, you know, from the get go. So it just kind of and I, I always consider myself lucky, and I think Bradley feels the same way that there was there was there was never really. I mean, a lot of my friends I remember growing up were you know uh, you know not really sure what they wanted to do in life and what their direction was, and there I I don't ever remember a time in my life where everything I did was geared towards getting to go fly airplanes and and drop retardant for a living. Yeah. Wow. Now, so at at some point in time, I would imagine at least that. You, you've been around it. You're you're swinging wrenches, as you mentioned. You get to do some of the maintenance tasks and helping on the ground and things like that. But at some point, you've got to go through back, go kind of backwards, and go through the formal channels. Uh, how, oh, yeah. how did you how do you do that? How do you go back and, and learn? Uh, I realized from, at a very uh, very young age that I was a terrible mechanic. So a lot of the maintenance <laughs> help that we did there is not was not good for me. So we did pretty much what everybody else does. I, I mean, we did everything in aviation. It was it's, well, not everything, but uh, flight instructing, towing gliders, Brian Cloud seated for a long time. Uh, I helped skydivers. We both helped skydivers. Just just everything you can to build time, you know. And then you get enough to get your first decent job. And and for for both of us, it was some corporate flying. Uh, and just you know do everything you can to bang out the hours and progress from there. And when did you start? That was that the, like was it the 16, 17 time frame or when? Yeah. Yeah, I think I was 16. I think Brian, Brian got a basketball scholarship, so he was he ended up focusing on other things. But I, I, I started, I soloed at 17 and got all my ratings. I was flight instructing by 20. Yeah, I was 20 when I was a flight instructor. So I just kept going as fast as I could. That's, that's so basketball scholarship? Uh, the other, the other uh, I guess, factor in our childhood was uh, we're very into athletics. And uh, my, my dad kind of, geared me towards as my basketball career kind of took off he geared me kind of pushed me away from aviation and into what I, I my goal was to fly in the military i wanted to fly in the marine corps and uh so he kind of pushed me to hey go you can always fly take take the free college get your degree you know go into the military go fly in the military and then you could you can always come back and fly tankers and you can always do that down the road but this is a once once in a lifetime opportunity that not everybody gets to get and uh saved him a bunch of money on on paying for college so um it was uh i i went and went and finished my degree and finished uh playing playing college basketball and then uh just happenstancely i i graduated college uh two months before september 11 happened and uh no, nobody was getting out uh they were having the highest officer retention they'd had in 20 years the airlines quit hiring so everybody that was in the guard and the reserves was going back to active duty and it was just it became very very difficult to get in and i, I didn't get accepted so Oh. And then I just, just like Bradley was saying, I went from there as soon as I graduated and realized that the military wasn't an option. I went straight to flight school. We both went to Sierra Academy of Aeronautics in Oakland and mm -hmm. uh, finished, finished all of our ratings there and then just hit, hit the street and started flying whatever we could get our hands on and building time however we could so we could eventually get into an air tanker. Now you mentioned you mentioned crop dusting and or, or as part of the way uh, uh, towards the tanker pilot. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I was uh, cloud seeding. Oh, cloud seeding. Yep, cloud seeding. We we both were are very fond and affectionate towards uh, crop dusting, but just the nature of our paths kind of all kept kept us getting it, you know kept us away from from doing anything ag related. But uh, but even though it's very near and dear to our hearts, but um, yeah, I, that was just one of the one of the after uh, flight instructing and uh, ferrying airplanes for for uh, different. Uh, uh, organizations, um, uh, opportunity came up to uh, cloud seed in the in the Central Sierras, and so I, I did that for a couple of years. And it was and I did did that ferried airplanes and and uh, had a, a corporate job all at the same time. So, wow, that's a lot of flying. Um, Phil, just just so people understand, fill people in on what cloud seeding is. So cloud seeding is when when the uh, the, the whole goal is to go and and 
basically add particulates into the clouds and to create, you know, put, uh, we use sil uh, silver iodine and we basically just fly back and forth. We'd have radar stations set up on the ground and we'd take off and we'd go fly back and forth on, on different radials. We had different tracks that were radials off of VORs and then we'd just fly back and forth and we had uh, 24 flares on, I flew uh, Piper Aztec and uh, had 24 flares on the back of the wings and we'd go, the, the meteorologists on the ground, we had communications with them and they'd tell us what track to go to and what altitude to fly. And then we'd just go back and forth and pop these flares that were attached to the back of the airplane. And the flares would release um, uh, silver iodine and a little, just to add the particulates for the water molecules in the clouds to grab a hold of. And it was uh, basically paid for by the state of California and by a conglomerate of farmers to add to the snowpack in the in the Sierras, so they would have more more runoff in the spring for uh, agriculture. Mm, so the goal is obviously create create more rain, create more snow by doing yeah. that. Absolutely. So, so so basically, uh, the the first stage of uh, of using aviation to uh, help manipulate or or nudge nature as best as you can. Exactly. So uh, obviously, getting back to to aerial firefighting. Um, I think it, it would help for everybody to understand some basics about what it's what it's all about before we get into the aircraft strategies, what it's like, what your lives are like daily. But um, this is an area I think that not a lot of pilots know a lot about. Like, what is the role that the aircraft play uh, in the overall uh, fight uh, uh, to control wildfires? When do you get involved, and and what are you trying to do? How's it control? What can you tell us? Well, CAL FIRE, for example, CAL FIRE treats uh, every every 911 call that comes in that's a reported smoke or fire, they launch as much stuff as they can to that fire as quickly as possible. So that's we're actually really successful at keeping 90% of fires, 95% of fires at under 10 acres, and we do that almost every day. So if you're out in the, out in the wild lands, up in the foothills or someplace and you see a smoke, somebody calls 911, uh, they punch a button and, and a series of fire engines go and a helicopter and an aerial supervision platform or an air attac and two air tankers and a helicopter. That's that's anytime during peak fire season, that's what happens. So uh, for us, we get the, in the S2, we like to get there as quickly as possible. We don't have a whole lot of retardant on board. We got 1,200 gallons each and there's two S2s at each base. So <clears throat> we, we try to get there as quickly as possible. We're usually airborne in about three minutes from the from the dispatch, wow. which is it's remarkable. There's the airplane, you know, the bases are usually strategically located close to the end of the runway and uh, we can, we, we train to this. It's not, it's not something that's unsafe. A lot of guys say, well, yeah, you know, you're, you're skipping checklists or you're doing this. So we, we train to that so we can get airborne really quick. Mm -hmm. So we're usually integrated with the, what we call the initial attack. So as soon as the incident commander gets there, there's a plan formulated. Uh, he'll relay, relay that to the air attack above us and we'll go to work. So in what's general, air attack? Fill, fill me in on on the from the top of the food chain down of controlling top all of the food this. Chain down, food chain down. So there's there's a, a 2,500 feet AGL above us. There's a a Rockwell OV-10 Bronco. That's we kind of we kind of glossed over the fact that we have a bunch of those as well. And in the back of of, of that aircraft is an accomplished uh, Cal Fire officer, either either a captain or a battalion chief, and they will get with the incident commander or whoever's running the fire, and they'll 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 uh, form tactics from there and relay that to us over a, a FM radio, and then we'll go to work. It's uh, it really is seamless once once you do it enough. But it, it we're usually integrated right off the bat, and that's something that happens really quickly, which is why we're as successful as we are is keeping the fires small. Everybody and that sees the news sees that we we have very large fires out here lately. But what what doesn't get reported is the amount of small fires that we stop. Right. So yeah, that makes the, sense. The will be at, yeah, the air attack will be at 2,500 feet. We're usually a thousand AGL, so we're about 1,500 feet below them, and then the helicopters will come in at 500 feet. So it's it's a it's a very orchestrated stack, and it's very uh, coordinated by the, by the air attack that's above us. So they're doing that. They're coordinating the airspace, um, figuring tactics on the ground, communicating with the ground, and finding out what the ground troops need. So and, and generally, on the, uh, how do frequencies work? Are people on the same frequency or? Yeah, so everybody, uh, everybody, we get issued a dispatch card, and everybody that's going to the fire in, in, in any, any aircraft will have that dispatch card. So there'll be a, a two Victor frequencies and, and an FM frequency, and CAL FIRE owns, I think, 10, how many air tactics frequencies do we have, Brian? Six, seven? Six. Six. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, everybody's on the same, 
same frequencies and it's very very coordinated including the ground uh, the folks on the ground yes is, is the uh the the retardant that you're dumping uh it, uh, is that dangerous to the ground crews? You have to be careful about where that coordination. Go ahead, Brian. Um, yeah, that's so. Just a, a, just to coincide with what we're talking about. I mean, I've been to I've been to five fires today already, and it's wow. fires that, fires that nobody will ever hear about because we we've the Cal Fire we keep ten, ten acres or less, and all of these were so uh, we we didn't drop on any of the fires, but we there was actual fire that we took off and went to and should there have been a need for retardant, we would do it. So um, Brad, Brad has a, uses a really good uh, analogy for, for fire retardant. We're basically carrying time. So we, we take the, the product out there, the fire retardant, and we uh, find, find something on the ground to anchor to, uh, whether it's a road or rocks or, you know, something that's not going to burn. And then we basically proceed to build a barrier of retardant around the fire. So the fire will either, uh, and we, we do from time to time, depending on what the ta what the tactics are, we, we will drop directly on the fl flames if it's a appropriate flame lengths and appropriate fuel type. We will drop directly on the flames and it will extinguish the flames directly, but not not completely. If a fire's not out until somebody's gotten in there with either a hose or a hand tool and, and put the flames out and actually scraped, uh, scraped the vegetation down to bare dirt and, and away from the fire. So we'll go out and um, and that's we just in fact went to a fire yesterday where uh, one of the air attacks uh, was was broken and so we got down there and we had to do all the communications in the air tanker and Brad can talk about this in a little bit when we start talking more about the uh, the qualifications that we need to have to do this job as an initial attack air tanker pilot but uh, we uh, myself and my partner uh, out of Columbia that where I'm at right now we went down and went to a fire by Oakhurst uh, east of Fresno and. Uh, um, I had to do all the coordination, uh, coordinate the helicopter, coordinate the uh, other air, the air attack that came from farther away. So we beat them to the fire. And then uh, before we took action, we coordinated with the uh, first arriving engines to, to get to the fire. And then the incident, incident commander when he arrived on scene. And uh, even though it was a going fire and, and burning pretty good, um, we, we'd like to coordinate with the guys on the ground and A, find out what it is they want and then uh, make sure that there's no firefighters in, in the way of where we're going to put the retardant down. And that's not to say that sometimes firefighters, I mean, you'll, you've seen on the nightly news lots that there's a lot of, a lot of yellow Nomex with, uh, re with pink stains on it, and that's from, from dropping the retardant on them. And they, they do get retardant on them from time to time because it's, it's close air support. It's, it's, it's yeah. you know, it's not unlike, um, you know, the armed forces that are out doing, you know, strategic close air support with, with guys on the ground. The guys on the ground tell you what, what they want, and we do the best we can to get it to them. And sometimes, uh, depending on the, the uh, intensity and veracity of the fire and whatever the particular tactics are, um, it's it it can be it can be pretty close to the guys on the ground. But we we um, especially in the drought conditions that we're at in California right now, the the overstory, the trees, uh, the oak trees, the pine trees, and all, all the all the taller vegetation in California is really weak right now because we're in an extended uh, extended period of drought. So it's really easy to we, they're called widow makers and uh, we would be be really careful to a drop at the appropriate height and then do everything we can to make sure that we're not dropping in the vicinity of ground firefighters. Is that is that dangerous to the ground firefighters uh, to it, drop it? It, it can yeah. be. Uh, retardant can knock them down. Um, so yeah. our our goal is to drop a at the minimum of 150 feet above the vegetation. Now that could be a, a, a hundred feet above. Uh, you know, a foot and a half tall grass, or it could be a hundred feet above, uh, you know, a hundred foot tall um, redwood tree. So right. um, the, the reason for that is, is that we want the forward momentum of the retardant to come to a stop the minute before it impacts the vegetation. So instead of having any forward momentum as it comes out of the airplane, it rains straight down through the vegetation. And that's the most concentrated that the retardant will be if you're dropping at the appropriate height and the appropriate altitude or appropriate airspeed and the appropriate altitude. Uh, that's the most concentrated the retardant will be when it comes straight down. And uh, there's another another phenomenon called shadowing. And if you drop low and drop too fast, it, it creates what's called a shadow. And it'll only coat one side of the vegetation. So you'll have, and it, it happens, believe it or not, it happens a lot in, in the lighter fuel models, fuel model one, uh, grass, um, sage, uh, you know, stuff like that, the light, lighter flashy fuels it'll hit the retardant and coat it on one side and then the fire will be able to burn underneath and then the other side of the vegetation will burn. So oh. we really want to make sure that we're on airspeed, on altitude, 
Uh, we really try to make sure that there's nobody in the way uh, just in case because, I mean, stuff happens, you, you know. It's hard to tell when you're diving down in the bottom of some hole someplace, you know, exactly how high you are over every piece of vegetation. And it, it, the possibility exists that if there is some forward momentum on the retardant, then it could dislodge a, a branch or a, a top of a tree and knock it down and, and impact firefighters on the ground. And that's our, our sole purpose in life is to support the, the men and women that are out there pulling hoses and swinging tools through the brush. So we want to, we want to do everything that we can to help them. And that's, that's not creating a big, bigger risk where we could potentially knock uh, vegetation loose or, or the forward momentum of the retardant knock firefighters down. That makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. I didn't realize that, uh, that, that the goal is to get it to then stop at the right moment and head down. I'm going to show a picture from um, what you've sent here. Um, and this is uh, one of them looks like the, the S2. Um, ex explain the S2 aircraft, first of all, to everybody so we can do that. That's the, based on the Orion? Uh, no, it's based on the, the tracker. So The tracker. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and this particular model, it was the last of the trackers built. It's the, we got them out of the desert. They're E and G model S2s, I believe, built in the early 60s. And they were a sub-chaser in the Navy. It's carrier-based, very, very strong airplane, big wing box. Uh, really good airplane, but they came with, you know, obviously being built in the 60s and 60s technology, they had radial engines on them. So in the late 90s, CAL FIRE acquired a bunch of them through a contractor and uh, refurbished them with, with Garrett-powered 1,600 horsepower engines and did some wing modifications, put some vortex generators on them, and they are a fantastic airplane. Wow. Uh, carries, carries 1,200 gallons of retardant. You can cruise to the fire at 220 knots, and it slows down remarkably well. So you can, our, our general drop target speed is between 125 and 135. Wow. So you're all, so you're slowing all the way down to 125 to 135 to, before you actually do a drop. And you mentioned you're, you're starting about a thousand foot AGL, but then your actual pass, you said about a hundred feet over the ground. Correct. Right. Well, so we'll be, we'll be in what's called the orbit at a thousand AGL. And then when, once the ATGS, the, the air attack that we talked about earlier, once they clear us to maneuver, we'll go down to about 800 feet AGL and start the drop pattern. Oh, what can you, th this is an amazing picture. I believe this is one of the ones you sent. What can you tell me about this? So that was a fire by Lake Elsinore. It's called the Evergreen Fire. And it's, it's, it was really challenging to get down to where that drop was. So the firefighters were up top. That's going down the right flank. They had scratched line. Like Brian said, they're scraping the vegetation away to bear dirt. And they've got up to the top of the right flank. And we needed some retardant on the left flank. The fire wasn't doing a whole lot. That's why I don't see a lot of smoke. But before they wanted to engage and go down the left flank, they wanted some retardant to check up kind of a little bit of a hot spot. So I attempted I attempted to do it out of a right turn twice and couldn't do it. Um, by the time I got the wings level and was pointing towards 150 feet, I was already at 140 knots. So uh, this is something that we train to and practice to. It looks, everybody sees it and says, oh God, that looks unsafe. We train to do this kind of thing all the time. It's it's just simple wing loading, load the wings up, dump the energy, and you can. I, I ended up making it down to the bottom at 125 knots. I don't, I don't think it looks unsafe. I think it looks amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a good looking shot because you got the firefighter standing there too. In the, in Absolutely. The That's, that is truly, truly amazing. Now this is, this is a great close up of the aircraft itself. Yeah, that's, that's an A model. So that, that was one of the first generation air tankers that Cal Fire uh, at, had at the time started in the early seventies, I believe. So you see, it's got the radial engines there and that's what, that was the model that was, we used prior to refurbishing with the turbine powered aircraft. Wow. And, uh, and then this is, this is refurbished. There's the next generation S2. Yep. That is, and it's amazing how much, how much is uh, coming out of that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, it, the airplane, a lot of people always kind of, it doesn't, it's not a very big airplane, but it weighs our gross weight, which is what we're at every day is 29,000 pounds. So it doesn't look like a 29,000 pound airplane, but between the wing box and the enormous tank that's in it, it's, uh, it's it's bigger than it looks. So tell me a little bit about the the mechanical side of what's actually in there because um, the the aircraft and mo most aircraft are either originally cargo or or have the ability for bomb bay doors. But you're actually equipping stuff in there that that's going to get released. Tell me a little bit about what's how it's designed. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, so there's there's a, a hydraulic system in there. It's basically a tank, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the S2, and then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, about the C-130, and then uh, some of the uh, previous airplanes that Brad and I flew, being the uh, Douglas DC-4 Skymaster and the uh, Lockheed P-2B Neptune, all had 
basically what was a throwback to what some of the uh, original uh, designs were. The, the first airplanes that dropped things on fires were, were basically crop dusters. They were uh, uh, PT-17 cadet uh, Stearman and uh, Naval Aircraft Factory N3Ns, and uh, they were basically crop dusters that just re readjusted their, their wastegate and took the spray booms off, and they, they mixed up some uh, sodium calcium borate that they put in the, uh, uh, in the, mixed in with the water to keep the water from atomizing when it came out of the airplane. Uh, and and went out and just by trial and trial and error figured out how to drop drop stuff on and in front of fires. Wow. The uh, the as the tank design evolved, it went into uh, like the DC-4 and the uh, P2V and a lot of the other airplanes, the A Model S2, um, uh, B-17s, um, PBYs, uh, uh, Fairchild C-119s, um, all, all the stuff that uh, Douglas DC-7s, all the stuff that you, you know for for years have been the backbone of aerial firefighting, all had uh, several compartments on the belly of the airplane, so they were they were they were doored systems. So there were several different between. I mean, I think it went all the way up to, to 18 doors on the KC-97, and uh, so yeah, and a lot of doors. And then uh, uh, what the DC-4 had what eight doors? Eight doors, yep. Yeah, and then the uh, P2B Neptune had six doors, and uh, so the, the P2 was was pretty easy because they it was basically the the bomb bay. They just took the bomb bay doors off. They built a, uh, a 2,800 gallon tank and shoved it up in the belly of the airplane and then came up with a, a hydraulic door system where we can control from the airplane where each individual door opened up and we could either drop two doors at a time, depending on the fuel type and without getting into too many details, depending on the fuel type or what was going on, we could drop either a lot of doors uh, at a time or we could drop single doors in a row at, to make a long trail drop. So that's basically how we varied the, the coverage level that we wanted the retardant on the ground for, for, for the particular fuel type. Um, where, where we're at now uh, is, uh, from what I can tell, is the, the best system that we have evolved to at this point, which is what's called a constant flow system. So instead of a bunch of separate compartments on the belly of the airplane, the S2, the C-130, and a lot of the newer platforms today have um, basically one giant compartment with baffling in it to keep the retardant from sloshing around. And then there's just two doors on the belly of the airplane. And so by not having those compartments on the belly of the airplane, would, would depending on the airspeed and the wind, would, would create gaps in the retardant. So what we'd have is, is weak spots in the retardant line where the doors overlapped each other. Mm -hmm. So the S2 and the C-130s that we're gonna have are all are, um, constant flow retardant tanks. So instead of having the kind of a chunkier drop pattern with doors overlapping each other, now it's just two doors that open up. They're computer controlled, so you can vary what the uh, what the either the IC on the ground, whether uh, the judgment that we use or whatever the uh, aerial supervision over the fire requests. Um, we use the the coverage level, and I keep saying I keep mentioning coverage level, and coverage level for us is is uh, gallons per hundred square feet. So if, if we're dropping in, in medium brush or, or a little bit of timber, we'll use a coverage level six or eight, or um, in, in the C-130, we can go all the way up to a coverage level 12. So that's 12 gallons per 100 square feet. And so yeah. if, if they're, they're computer controlled and the rate at which that retardant comes out is all computer controlled. There's, there's floats and sensors inside the tank that modulate the amount, the, the opening of the doors on the belly of the airplane. So if it's a light coverage level, it'll just open up a little bit. And as the amount of fluid in the tank comes down, you start losing what's, what's called head pressure, and that's the weight of the retardant on top of itself. So as that comes down, the computer realizes that, okay, I don't have the amount of head pressure I did with a fuel load. So as the airplane's dropping, the doors will modulate and open wider in order to get that same consistent constant flow pattern of, of retardant on the ground. Wow, that's a lot of stuff happening uh, happening at once and a lot of different types of aircraft with that. Let me clarify a few things just to make sure I understand it uh, for everyone. So first of all, you keep referring to fuel, and by that you mean what's burning on the ground. Is that correct? Correct. So you yep. mentioned grasses versus trees versus things like that, and you have to you have to be the expert in that. You have to know what you're what you're fighting against. Yeah, well, we, we've we've got our uh, aerial supervision, the Cal Fire aerial supervision that are basically the command and control on the fires. Are they're all very, very, very experienced, uh, like Brad said, captains or battalion chiefs. They've spent years and years and years with every fuel type, you know, in the Western United States. They've got experience with it. 
they're, you know, we have a briefing every morning. We talk about fuel moistures. We talk about the wind. We talk about the relative humidity. All of those factors, you know, what what other airplanes we're going to have available to come to to a fire if we do have an incident. And so they take all that stuff into consideration as to uh, what what the tactic is going to be for a particular fuel type. So they're they're very they then they've they're all experienced ground firefighters and they've seen it on the ground. They've seen what retardant penetrates. What's you know if it's if it's chemise or manzanita, you know they'll, they they can get there and say, hey, it's we got single digit relative humidities today. We've got pretty good wind. We've got good good uh, ventilation today. We're we're going to a fire in eastern Lake Napa and it's it's all all the chemise and manzanita that you know they've gone to those fires a hundred times before. So they know before they even get there by looking at the smoke column. What kind of coverage level they're going to be using for that fire? Wow! And, and then and I the, want to show this as well because you got uh, another amazing picture here of uh, of an aircraft going in and, and fighting. This really shows, I, I think, the the altitude that you tend to fly at. Yeah, that's uh, just outside of Reno last year. That's an incredible, inc incredible, incredible picture to say uh, to say the least. Um, so that that's really fascinating and you've got there are so many different types of aircraft you mentioned that are involved in in fighting fires i know um people have have seen things uh, if, if they've even just watched news or seen some interesting things on the internet that go what's the, from the really you know the smaller line of things we showed even something like fire boss in the very beginning all the way up to big big stuff uh, uh, DC 10s and and I think uh, I don't know if they're online anymore, but the 747. How does the, how do the decisions get made as to when you want to do different types of 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 aircraft? What what the roles are for different types size aircraft in fire? And that that's where experienced uh, air tax, like we talked about the 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 Cal Fire officers that are in the back of the airplane, or or a Forest Service officer, or who whoever's in the back of the the air, the super the supervision aircraft. They'll kind of make that that decision as the fire progresses. So uh, generally, if you launch on an initial attack and you send two S2s out and uh, you, you do whatever you can tactically, but it's just not working. It's it's a hot, dry, windy day, and then you, you say it burns through our retardant line or the fire's spotting, which means it's throwing casting embers out into the burnable fuel, and then you just, it just there's not much we can do with aircraft, right? So that's that's when different tactics come to play, and they'll order bigger aircraft and and that's it kind of goes what we call extended attack at that point so you'll get uh move off to the next ridge and and get some ground troops to cut some line and then reinforce that line with retardant and you know the s2 is a great initial attack airplane but once you get past a couple hundred acres there's not much you can do unless you have about 20 of them so that's when you need something like a dc-10 i mean it's you hear it a lot in this industry <clears throat> excuse me it's it's tools in the toolbox right so if you're if you're going to do a small project, you just need a screwdriver and a set of pliers. If it's mm -hmm. going to be a big project, you need a lot of stuff. So, <laughs> tools in the toolbox. Everybody's got their place. Uh, like the picture of the fire boss is a good example. If you got a, a water source that's close by, like a lake, fire's burning next to a lake, four or five of those can do a lot of work in, in a very short period of time. So, uh, big big tools, big concept, all that stuff. What uh, it, now? You mentioned helicopters. Uh, tell me a little bit about the role on the smaller aircraft as well on the on, on fire between helicopters, single engine things like the Fire Boss. Brian knows more about helicopters than I do. What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> well, so it, and it's it's very situational, right? So like if you take California, like I've spent the first 14 years of my tanker career uh, uh, flying federal airplanes all over the United States. So I was on a federal contract to the United States Forest Service. So, like, you take the fire boss for an example. Um, I spent a lot of time in Minnesota during the Minnesota fire season, which is early, and and the the fire bosses and the uh, the CL 415s and CL 215 scoopers and the CL 215Ts. Um, that's that's fantastic country for for those airplanes. Um, the fires are usually not horribly intense, and and you can really go direct with water. And it's it's a it's a tactical shift and a tactical change along with helicopters, what you do with water. So re retardant is basically a barrier. I mean, it works as an extinguishant, but it's it's a retardant. It coats the fuels out in front of the fire, coats the vegetation, and, and slows the fire down when it burns into it. Water is used tactically. So water, and, and you know, water, you go directly on the fire. That's it's as simple as that. It goes you go directly on the fire and you try to knock knock the knock the you know knock the heat out of it and slow it down and allow um, allow 
basically time for the ground firefighters to get there and cut, cut the fuels away. It's the same thing with the helicopters. And it, it's it, and so you take Minnesota, and that works great in Minnesota because there's so much water and there's so many lakes in Minnesota, and, and there's not near the terrain that we have in California. So you move all the way to the other side of the country, and then you come to California where we have um, a more, I guess, common, you would say, fire season. Um, you know, a lot of places in the country don't really have a fire. They'll have little fire seasons, but they don't, don't normally have a, a, a traditional fire season like we have in California every year. That's every why the, year. State of Cal- the state of California has a, a network set up and tanker bases so that we can have a helicopter, two air tankers, and an air attack over any piece of, of, of state responsibility area in California within 20 minutes. Yep. So, wow. and it's, wow. and, and so that's... It's it's necessary in California to have that kind of response and have that kind of be able to carry that kind of a stick when you know you're going to traditionally have a, a a pretty bad fire season with a lot of what's called wildland urban interface. There's there's a lot of a lot of houses out in the in the hills and the brush and uh, in mountainous terrain that uh, it really really requires having more large air tankers and and then a quick reaction force from from the the Cal Fire fleet of the of the S2s and the uh, UH1H Hueys and the S70I Firehawk. It's really amazing to me uh, that it is almost uh, almost a year-round season. There's a, I'm going to show another picture here um, uh, of one that that uh, this was a, a map that was online of all of the different aircraft at any given time up having to do with strategic fight uh, uh, wildfire fighting. Yep. Um, that's a you guys have a lot, a lot going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Yeah. It, it's very well orchestrated, though. I mean, it's it's uh, a lot of training takes place. A lot of you know, there's a lot of checks and balances. A lot of it's orchestrated. Yep. Oh, I, I I certainly get that sense, that to say the least. And I'll actually I'll show a picture of that too because this is a picture uh, that you sent of of uh, just a small piece of the crew. Yep. Yeah. And and this is this is on the C-130. So. Um, Tell me a little bit about the C-130. Um, the C-130s, um, I started flying the C-130s in uh, 2016 in uh, Australia. Uh, I went to work for a, a private uh, uh, operator that uh, got EC-130Qs, got them surplus uh, from the from the military. They were uh, former Navy command and control air- aircraft. They were, um, uh, we'd use C-130s, uh, A model C-130s uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, and they, they proved to be a, a really good air tanker. The, there were some some structural issues on the A model that led to a couple of accidents that kind of gave the C-130 a bad reputation in, in the firefighting business. And uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> over like Chicago. <laughs> um, this is you in the uh, C-130, right? <laughs> yep, that's in, that's in one of our C-130s, that's in Tanker 118. Um, over like, um, so the later model C-130s are obviously maintained a lot better and are built a lot better. A lot of the issues that uh, took place with the A model aren't, aren't existent on the on the later models, especially the H. Um, so, like Brad was saying, um, you know, with the with the basically the year-round fire season in California now and the um, the the ferocity and the intensity of, of fires that we're having now to due to basically fuel buildup in the, in the forests from putting out fires for so long and the, and the urban wildland urban interface that we experience now with so many people moving out of the cities and moving out into the, out into the, into the wildlands and, and into the, into the foothills. Um, Cal Fire decided that they, they needed to be able to rely on a uh, consistent fleet of, of large air tankers. So the C-130 carries uh, 4,000 gallons of retardant. It's got a, a really efficient constant flow retardant tank, the retardant delivery system that's going to be installed in it that uh, Colson Colson uh, produce Colson Aviation uh, produces. Um, so it's it's basically going to be the uh, the kind of the big stick for uh, for California once fires get. Uh, it'll be used for an, it's a good initial attack air tanker too. Um, it, it does a really good job. It's very maneuverable. It flies at the similar speeds that the S2 does, um, but the the impact that that airplane will have on the state is when that we do get into the uh, get into a fire situation, um, especially later in the season when we start getting we kind of, kind of call it over the ridge. Once the fire gets over the horizon and it starts going into what's called an extended attack incident, we'll be able to take a couple of the S2s instead of just using the S2s to build miles and miles of retardant line. We'll be able to send the S2s back to their original bases, back to their home bases, so they can be used for initial attack on another fire that comes up. And 
use the C-130s to go out and, and be the, the kind of a big stick on, on the larger already going fires. Wow, that makes uh, that certainly makes a lot of sense. I mean, everything just being this kind of graduated approach to yeah. do uh, uh, to how you're fighting uh, uh, all of that. Tell me a little bit about the, the typical day. What uh, you know, how many hours you're flying, and 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 what it's actually like to fly the aircraft in these in these situations. Well, one more one more thing I wanted to say about the C-130 real quick is that so the the there's there's no airplane on earth that I'm aware of that can do what the S2 does. Uh, to, to take off out of the foothills, carry the weight that it's carrying, the maneuverability that it has to go out and, and drop retardant and the, the speed and manner at which they do in, in California from all of our various bases around the state. There's no airplane on earth that can do what the S2 does. So wow. the, big, the big impact that the C-130, the other, the other big impact that the C-130 is gonna have on the state is that w we can use C-130s forever. They're still making them. Uh, we can we can get them through federal access. Um, you know we can we can use, there's there's enough C-130s on the planet and enough parts uh, you know that we can operate C-130s forever. And the beauty is is that we can start relying on the C-130s to go to the bigger extended attack fires and keep keep the uh, the wear and tear on the S-2s down. And mm. there's uh, they're working on an Iran program right now where they're going to uh, start bringing when the when the C-130 does show up they're going to start bringing the S-2s in and doing a complete rebuild in Iran of that platform since, because there, there's, there, it's a very limited platform. There's not, you know, there's no, there's not 20,000 uh, S2s, you know, sitting in Davis Monthan that we can just pull out and put it, you know, re regen and put tanks in, but, the, but there is C-130s. So right. that's the biggest right. impact is that it's, it's the S2 is the crown jewel of the, of, of the fleet in California. And it's uh, my, my big hope is that, you know, with the C-130 is coming online, that we'll really be able to extend the, uh, the life of the S2 into the, into the extended future. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, so uh, now, again, you, you mentioned you've been, you've fought five fires, five missions already today. Um, yep. What, how many hours do you typically fly on a, on a day like, like today or, or something like that? Well, well, the only, there's, ahead, no, Brad. there's no typical day. Yeah, <laughs> Brian and I have always joked about it. It's, and we touched on it. It's everything situational. So we always say, kind of the, the the golden rule, the key word to this whole business is it depends. It just everything depends. So Brian's sitting in a ready room right now at a tanker base, which is exactly like a fire station. And at any moment right now, it hit, the bell could ring, and it's not so much a bell, but a fire tone will go off that will signal to him that he's getting a dispatch, and he'll walk down to his airplane and go. And That's you mentioned a, an amazing statistic, which is three minutes to, to being able to be airborne. I assume everything's pre-flighted just like you would a fire truck or something yeah, like that. You know, it's, it's ready to go. And go you've got an morning. abbreviated checklist to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially in the S2, it was, it was kind of designed to be that way for us when it was, when it was refurbished into an air tanker. Um, we do a lot, of, a lot of flows backed up by checklists. And the airplane is usually, so Brian will show up to work at 10 a.m., which is usually they call, they call it startup time. And uh, generally, we go to 30 minutes prior to sunset. That's that's your duty day. Um, we're limited to 14 hours of being on duty and limited to seven hours of flight time. Mm. So, uh, like I said, Brian will show up at, at 30 minutes prior to start up and do a good pre-flight. Make sure the cockpit's ready to go, <clears throat> and that way you can just with a dispatch, climb in the airplane, turn the batteries on, hit the start button. Right, right. And with uh, uh, them being uh, turbines, it's you, you don't even you don't even have the the excess minutes to uh, of run up or anything like that. No waiting for oil temperature. Well, we try to wait for oil temperatures, but generally on a warm day like where Brian's at right now, it's you know oil temps are. are, are by the time you get the props unlocked, it's you're, you're at oil temps. So, um, um, do you have special uh, clearances in order to not have to worry about any kind of traffic or anything else in your way or waiting on the ground for anybody? No, nah, unfortunately, seventy probably seventy five percent of our airports are non controlled, so uh, uncontrolled. So it's uh, we're we're public use aircraft, so there's some of that, but there's really no clearance, no nothing. We just you know, like Brian was touched on earlier, we get our weather briefing in the morning. You know, we, everybody's got four four flights, so we kind of you know, double check TFRs, make sure we're not going to bump airspace. But at the end of the day, being public use, um, we can, we kind of get away with a few different things. And another another beautiful thing is that being in California, like the base that I'm at in the in the foothills right now, everybody that flies out of these airports, when they hear the OB10 fire up and go out for a fire dispatch, like our our air attack will fire up 440s, taxi into 17, two tankers in tow, and just the last dispatch that we went to, there was two two other air because we we 
take off in one direction and it may not be the direction that the wind's blowing so they might be flying a pattern for the other direction and uh the two other airplanes that were doing touch and goes in the pattern they, they live in the foothills they know what we're going to do they know the importance of what we're doing and it, it's very nice that most of the general aviation in california along as along with a lot of the faa controllers like when we have the big fires going in southern california and in the bay area when you call up and, and use your tanker call sign, they're they're very very aware of what we're doing, and they do everything in their power to in their power to accommodate us. And like I said, the two guys that were in the pattern here at Columbia doing touch and goes, they said, "Hey, we're gonna make uh, we're gonna head west and uh, go uh, go out over the lake until you guys are out of the way." And so it's just they they get it, and it's it's very we're we're very appreciative of of air traffic control and and a lot of the general aviation folks in California that realize what what we're doing and that the time is of an of the essence and that they they kind of they kind of know the know the deal and they they get out of the way because we it might be their house that uh, we're we're going out to drop a tartan on. At, at no question. It's like pulling over on the side of the road when any emergency vehicle is happening. You know, you're you're more than happy to do it. Yep, um, absolutely. What's the, uh, it, it, is it tough? Is it, is it really turbulent? How hard is the flying it itself to do in it those depends. conditions? It depends. <laughs> it, depends. <laughs> uh, it can be really easy or really challenging. I mean, it, it's some of the, the, some of the weather phenomenons we get in California, one of the biggest ones is the Santa Ana winds in Southern California. We can get up, up to 60 to 80 mile per hour winds and it is, it's as turbulent as turbulent can be. And, you know, lots of different low level wind shears, um, fortunately, we have a good safety program and a lot of good support from upper level management. And it's if it doesn't feel right, we shut it down, and that's just the way it is. It's and it doesn't happen too often, but it does. What can you, you have pilots. any stories of some of the hardest things that you've actually been in with some of the the epic fires, for example, that have made the news, et cetera? Well, generally, I'll I'll speak to a couple just just from my perspective. But generally, when when the fires get that big and get super out of control, they're usually pretty pretty benign for us because we're, like we talked about earlier, we're out of the really initial attack mode and the most effective thing for us to do is back off a couple of ridges or whatever whatever tactic that the, that the ground firefighters and the air attack have decided is best and we'll back off and it's generally a little easier unless, the, unless it's really windy or lately the last couple of years we've been dealing with a lot of smoke, we get four or five extended attack large fires and the, the visibility drops down to a mile or a half mile and you got a bunch of airplanes out there droning around in the smoke that aren't on any kind of instrument clearance or anything like that and that's that that to me has been the most challenging lately is getting out there and we don't do a lot of instrument flying to begin with so we're out there in reduced viz and try, trying to do a pretty difficult job as it is so that that's been the most challenging well um, tell me a little bit about what it takes to become a, a, a tanker pilot. Uh, what's involved in this whole kind of progression? Uh, you mentioned that you've got a, a whole lot of pilots there and you're training them and getting them ready regularly. Yeah, that's 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 been really challenging lately. Obviously, pre-COVID, there was a pretty significant pilot shortage, right? I mean, the airlines were hiring like crazy and we were just were not finding the kind of candidates that we were looking for. Um, it, it it takes it used to it used to we used to have a pretty good pipeline so you'd start out flying the air attack ship and, and for you know a couple of good seasons and you'd learn fire and fire progression and tactics and all that stuff that's challenging uh, airspace deconfliction all, all that kind of stuff after two or three years of flying the, the bronco and and as an air attack platform you'd get a pretty good idea how things worked and and you could really start attention diverting your attention to how to how to drop the retardant well, unfortunately with with our a lot of different factors it's been really hard to train guys because we're, we're guys and gals because we're uh, we're taking brand new pilots and training them to be air tanker pilots it's the days of being able to uh draw from a pool of of co-pilots or air tac pilots that have flown five or six seasons we're just not there anymore so <clears throat> it's been really really challenging uh the, the best way to do it is we, we've got a really between Brian's crew and my crew we have a really really solid instructor cadre with with a pretty healthy amount of experience and uh, we've been able to really figure out how to crash course training if you will because we, we need more airplanes we need more pilots we just need all that stuff because fires are getting bigger and seasons are getting longer and all that stuff so we've been training a lot um, Cal Fire has been great the, the budgets have been great we've been able to really do a lot of training and and uh, so that's that's the basic progression of things. You uh, spend a full—it's usually about a full full season to two seasons to, uh, of on-the-job training, and that's the the only way to really do it is to train on the job. Right. 
And then what, what rating is, what ratings required? And then you mentioned uh, some other things, including uh, that the uh, initial attack card. So take me through yeah, so just what type initial, of ratings people are talking about. Basic, basically, initial attack card is, is a license to, to go to a fire, whether it be a federal fire or state fire. And, and the expectations are that you can talk to the ground uh, you can you can develop tactics on your own and apply the apply those tactics and apply the retardant accordingly and that's that can be challenging because it's not so much flying at that point you have to you have to really have a fireman's mindset you have to be able to, to the airplane has to be second nature at that point you need to be able to have the airplane flown in a precision manner and then divert all of your attention outside to to figure out what's going on with the fire and, and how you're going to fight the fire so that's that is a struggle for a lot of really really good pilots that we've trained over the years that. It, it you you fly with a guy that's coordinated and smooth and can fly a precise airplane and then you get to a pretty significant fire where things are starting to go south and there's a lot of airplanes and a lot of things not going the way they should go and the task saturation and the things start to go south so you really have to be able to divert your attention as much as you possibly can to where the airplane is almost second nature you're not even paying attention really to the airplane anymore so um so our, our contract calls for a commercial pilot certificate, uh, 1,800 hours of PIC time and 800 hours of multi-engine PIC time, um, well, obviously with a multi-engine rating and an instrument rating, uh, but no, not an ATP or anything like that. Um, and then and then we start the training from there. So it, it really is a surprising blend, it sounds like, of uh, type rating and understanding the aircraft would see the pants kind of flying, being able to Absolutely. have it so second nature that it's happening anyway while you're doing other things. Yeah, and we've 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 there is no litmus test, if you will. There's no there's no one background that that we look for that will that has proven to work really well for us. We have a lot of military former military pilots, uh, anywhere from fighter pilots to bush pilots to everything, and uh, there's just a, a lot of different backgrounds help. But it's uh, it's challenging to find. You can't really put your finger on what is the the perfect background to make an easy uh, a, a easy transition to a tanker pilot. It's, it's just there just isn't one. Right, and that, that that makes sense. But what an amazing amazing job to say the least <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> to do that. It it certainly must take a, a very very special person to be able to to do all of those things. Now you keep mentioning the the, the drops and et cetera. Uh, is is it the the pilot the the sole manipulator of the controls, including dumping? Yeah, and the, and the S2, S2 is a single pilot airplane. I think I left that part out, but that's a pretty big one. So you, you, you've got a lot of radio frequency, a lot of frequencies to manage, a lot of everything else is going on while you're in there by yourself. The C-130 has uh, obviously a crew of three, it's captain, a co-pilot, and flight engineer. And okay. yes, the PIC, the PIC with the initial attack guard is the one that's pushing the button. And what's that like as far as pushing, pushing the button? Are you setting rates and calculating things and then also dropping? Um, yeah, if if there's supervision there, and that's that's the hard part. So, or not the hard part, but there's there's supervision there. So if the air attack uh, with with the firefighter in the back will he'll usually tell us what covers level to use, what the tactic is, and that's that's a standard day, and that's pretty simple. But if there's no air attack there due to resource drawdown or mechanical failure or something, that's when we have to actually things get a lot more complicated from there. The the and, bandwidth gets the bandwidth gets spread thin when you when you have to talk to the guys on the ground. You're clearing all the other aircraft, and uh, you're you're talking to the um, emergency communication uh, command center and letting them know what the fire is doing and that you're on scene. Uh, uh, there, and then at, once you get all that stuff squared away and and squared away appropriately, then then you have to kind of fall back on boy, I I I got I got all the other aircraft cleared in. I've made contact with the IC and we figured out what the tactic is. Um, I, all the communications have been done appropriately. Everybody knows what they're doing. Now I got to figure out how to get down there and put the retardant where it needs to go and get back out. Yeah. Wow. And, well, and is there any of, type of sighting that, that you've got, or it's all just what you normally have as a sight picture going outside the aircraft? It's all sight uh, picture. Yeah, it's all sight picture, and then, and they're all different from all, all every air tanker I've flown. It's all it's all a little bit different. Wow. So uh, no surprise, but we do have people dialing in and asking what the oldest pilot, for example, that you'd hire. Or that they... <laughs> I Hello, think you've Nick. got some volunteers here ready to line up. <laughs> Is there, are there any age limits on interviewing with you guys? No age limits. And, and how many uh, uh, pilots are currently uh, on staff that you've got? Uh, what are we up to? I got that in my office somewhere. I, we're up to 65, I think, 65 pilots. Wow. Excellent. Throughout the whole program. 
Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned a large number of mechanics as well that work there. Yes. Yes. And, and we, we, we get too carried away with the, with the, um, I guess the, the fun part of the job, but the, the, our maintenance is incredible, and we have a, a a large group of very dedicated, very talented mechanics, and that they do a really good job of keeping our airplanes airworthy and keeping us safe. Excellent. Hey, I want to make sure that we take time also to give a shout out to uh, your dad, uh, Doug Baker, who, of course, that's the reason that you guys are are in that. And you you told a couple, brief, you gave me a couple of brief uh, stories or background on how he got started. And, and got into this uh, so that you guys could sit on top of that S2 and then eventually be where you are today. Tell me a little bit about about Doug. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of a funny story. He always the, we we grew up in a small town called Ukiah, California, and uh, he uh, he moved with his family from Los Angeles. Um, they lived in San Francisco for a short time and then moved to Ukiah. My grandpa got a job up there and. Uh, they were before they got into a house. They were living in a hotel, and it's it's funny because his his eyes light up. And if he was sitting here telling the story right now, you would think it happened yesterday. But um, he remembers being a little kid and uh, going out and playing out in the front yard of this hotel they were staying at, li living at, and uh, hearing something and looking up and and seeing a Grumman F7F Tiger Cat come over the top of the hotel because it was right at the right right at the end of the runway and seeing an F7F Tiger Cat come over the top of the hotel in a in a hard right turn doing an overhead approach to land and he said from that point on there was no question that he was going to be a tanker pilot and they, they lived there for a, a couple of months that summer and he said the first time he saw an F7F taxi by with the pilot you know with the canopy open waving at him as, it, as they were taxiing out to take off he said that that was it I'm, I, I was going to be a tanker pilot. That's awesome. Absolutely love that. And he and you said uh, he's he, he's been doing that. Well, well, he works at the city. He he's, has the same employer you do, right? Yep. He's on duty today, yeah. I think. Yep. <laughs> I, I can only imagine what it would be like to parachute in on Thanksgiving dinners and listen in on that. <laughs> Everybody says the same thing. Boy, I, I guess we can we can all guess what you guys talk about at the dinner table. It's pretty exactly. bad. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, uh, both you guys, uh, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your busy day and, uh, and, and part of your evening as well to join us here on, on Social Flight Live. Uh, and thank you for the work that you do, really. It, it is it's just uh, amazing. You're saving, of course, lives and property on a regular basis. And I want to make sure everyone out there understands one of the most significant things I think that came up, which is it's not the big fires that make the news. It's the small fires that you guys are able to contain day in and day out, all five missions you've already flown today, Brian, and, uh, and the things you keep from turning into to large things. So uh, really, uh, uh, thank you for the work that you do, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the show. Thank Absolutely. you. Our pleasure. Excellent. Anyway, uh, thanks uh, uh, for anyone else there. If we didn't get to your questions, then uh, feel free to email. We'll do what we can to get some of those answered. Really do appreciate um, all of the information that we got. It's so, so much of the exciting world of aerial firefighting here with Brian and Brad Baker. We will be back next Tuesday here, May 18th, with Mike Bush talking about saving money on aircraft maintenance. On Tuesday, May 25th, Jack Pelton will be joining us here, and we're going to be talking about Air Venture 2021 and the return of Air Venture. Some big news coming out of that show. Jack will be talking about, and on June 1st, Sebastian Hines of Zenith Aircraft. Until next time, thank you all so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon, Blue Skies.